How many know that and believe that, that God is good? Yep. Yeah, let's pray. Father, we lift you up right now in the precious name of the blood of your son, Jesus Christ. We are so thankful and grateful to be here, Father, to receive from you. And so I pray that I not be seen nor heard, but it would be you alone working through me. As we come here to celebrate, Father, how good you are, as we come here with excitement and passion to have a good time in your word, Father, God, I pray that you speak directly into our lives, that there'd be nothing hindering us, Father. In the name and the blood of Jesus Christ, I rebuke anything that would try to hinder us from receiving from you today, but we'd be free to learn, free to grow, free to worship, Father, even as, as we get into your word to just acknowledge the goodness of you. We love you and we honor you in the precious name and the blood of Jesus Christ, all God's children said. Glory to God. Amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy to be praised. <laughs> Hallelujah. Worthy to be praised. Yeah, don't forget tonight's skate night at uh, Skate Away on Hall Street, just behind the, uh, the Waffle House there um, from 5 to 7 o'clock. Some of you have been given the excuse that your back hurts, but... Uh, you know, that might pop it into place, amen? It might, it might fix your ailments. Let's go to Judges chapter 13. Judges chapter 13. I'm really excited. God bless you. I'm, I'm really excited to give this word this morning. Um, I thought I was preaching on something totally different today that the Lord was showing me this week, but then as I got here this morning, he revealed to me uh, what, what we would be talking about this morning, and so I'm, I'm really excited to show you what God has grown me into, um, and I just pray that he grows us all in it together. Judges 13, we're going to begin with the first verse. If you don't have your Bible, read along on the screen or share with someone next to you. If you, if you have a Bible and you notice someone near you doesn't, then what should you do? Yeah, you should. Amen. Judges 13, the first verse, and this is what the Word of God says. Praise the Lord. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for how many years? Forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of Danites whose name was Manoah. And his wife was barren and she had no children. And the angel of the Lord God appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now listen, this is the angel speaking to him, be, or to her. Behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a what church? A son. Okay, so, so this... This is exciting stuff here, okay? She, she's not been able to have a son. The angel of the Lord shows up and says, you're fitting to have one. Look at, the, look at the fourth verse. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. And then in verse 6, the woman came and told her husband, a man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God. Very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name, but he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. The Nazarites, the Nazarites were set aside for the work and the glory of God. Verse 8. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord. So this is the soon-to-be daddy. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord God and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again to us and to teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. And so you've got to understand, both of them still aren't convinced yet that they've seen an angel. Verse 9, and God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband, was not with her. So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, behold, in the 10th verse, behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. 
And Manoah arose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, What church? I am. Verse 12, And Manoah said, Now when your words come true, what is it to be the child's manner of life? And what is his mission? Many of us here today may still be wondering what our mission is. Amen? She's already asking before the child has been, uh, been birthed. Or he's asking, verse 13, And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I've said to the woman, let her be careful. In other words, the angel of the Lord is saying, Make sure she doesn't drink strong drinks, she doesn't drink wine, she doesn't eat any unclean things. Verse 14, She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So in other words, the angel of God is saying, Do what I told you to. And verse 15, Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, Please let us detain you and prepare a young goat for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, If you detain me, in other words, if you hold me up from where I need to go, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it unto who? The Lord God. For Manoah did not know, listen, Manoah did not know that he was an angel of the Lord. But something really incredible is about to take place. Look at verse 17. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name so that when your words come true, we may honor you? And the angel of the Lord God said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? If you look in, the, in, 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 in other translations, it says rather than seeing it is wonderful, it says it is beyond your understanding which I think is really cool because when all of us go to heaven, the Word of God talks about every one of us are going to get a name and we're not going to be able to understand what the other person's name is. Amen? Isn't it cool how God's Word sews together like that? So, so when, when, when you go to heaven and you get a new name, I'm not going to understand the full fulfillment meaning of that name. But you and the Lord will. Amen? Now, this is what's incredible. The angel, in, in the original text, the angel says, when, when, when Manoah asks, what's your name? The angel says, you can't understand it. I think that is so cool, man. I think it is so cool. Isn't it wonderful how even the Old Testament lines up so beautiful with the New Testament? It is so cool that we get names that one another won't be able to understand, and the angels have names that we can't understand either. Matter of fact, it says, when, he, when Manoah says, what is your name? The angel says, it's beyond your understanding. I am so honored that I serve a God that I can't fully understand. You see what I'm saying? Because if I could fully understand him, that would put him on my level. And I'm a failure too many times. How many, how many other people here have failed at things? Right? If you can't raise your hand to that, you're failing right there. Amen? I mean, we, we're, we're, we're unloving. How many people are, un, are unloving at times? How many people are uncaring and unemotional at times? How many people don't understand what other people are trying to do at times? You see what I'm saying? And the angel says, you're asking me my name, but man, I'm telling you, it's beyond your reason. I thank God that he is so incredible. He's beyond reason. I don't have a reason for it other than he's just God. That is so, so cool to me. All right, let's press on. Look at, look at the 18th verse. And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful. So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord. So the one who works wonders and Manoah and his wife were watching. Now watch this, verse 20. This is, this is so cool. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now up until this point, Manoah and his wife thought that this was a man of God. And all of a sudden, what they thought to be a man now reveals himself as an angel of the Lord. And he gets up into the flame and goes up from the burnt offering in the fire back into heaven. Is that cool stuff or what? Now, when you read and understand what just took place, now it's even easier to get a grip on the things that, no, we can't understand his name either. Amen? I can't understand how he did that other than he's just in the spirit, and that's how he did it. So there's no wonder I can't understand what his name means. That's why there's a question mark, church. That's why there's a question mark after the word wonderful when the angel responds to him, isn't it too wonderful? So let's look on. 
verse 20. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. Now Manoah and his wife were watching, and they fell on their faces to the ground. Anybody in here ever had an aha moment? There it is for these two. And verse 21 says, the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah and to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. But his wife said to him, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or shown us all these things or now announced to such things as these. Basically, what we don't know Manoah's wife's name. It's not mentioned in the text. But what we do know is Manoah's wife was a woman of reason, at least in this moment. She's saying, get a grip, man. Anybody ever had to do that to your husband before? Slow down and get a grip. Manoah, Manoah's realizing the magnitude of what he's just seen and what's just taken place. He's thinking his world, not the world. He's thinking his world's coming to an end. He says, we're going to die. We're going to die, baby. We just see God. I mean, imagine what he just saw. This, this person that he thought was a man, which is actually an angel in spirit, but that he thought was a man, just got up in the fan of the flames and went on up into heaven. And he looks at it and he says, we're going to die, baby. We're going to die. And she says, get a grip. If we were going to die, he wouldn't have said that I was going to be pregnant. And he wouldn't have told me not to eat a divine and drink strong drink. And he wouldn't have told me to eat undefi uh, de defiled foods, unclean foods. Get a grip. We're not going anywhere. Some of us just need to get a grip on life at times. Amen. We need to just re-inventory, re-evaluate. Get a grip, man. Get a grip, woman. Get a grip, child. You know what I mean? So get a grip. We're not going anywhere. But isn't it something how Satan would love to make confusion take the church away from the grip? How many of you can remember when you first rode a bicycle? Can you go that far back? <laughs> Somebody in the back said, easy now. Now, how many of you could remember your next big step of jumping a little homemade ramp? Set your little board up on the brick. Now, let's take it big time, big time, big time. How many of you can remember the very first time that you rode with no hands? You, you, you guys remember riding with no hands? I tried this last year. Don't try it, folks. I used to be the pro. We, we, had, we had a neighborhood that was over a mile long growing up. And I used to love to start at the front. And I'd make it to the end of that neighborhood. There was a cul-de-sac. I could turn all the way around with no hands and head back up the street. I could go up decent-sized hills, not mountains. I could go up decent-sized hills. You remember you take your hands and grab the bottom of your seat for some more grip? Ugh, 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 ugh. I could keep that thing so straight, man. It was just, boom, straight and narrow. No hands, baby. No hands on the mountain bike. It was just great. Last year, I was riding in the neighborhood with my older son. I let him get ahead of me so he couldn't see my failure. See that? Got to be smart about it. I tried to go no hands, and it was like, it was like a horse fence in the Amelia County pasture somewhere. It's like this. I knew not to try no more. Sometimes our spiritual journey can be like that, right? Sometimes our journey can be like that in, in life with Christ. We could just be going. It's a well fine old machine. And then sometimes we notice a little whoop. Y'all like that move? You see that? And you just got to grab, grab hold of grip. Manoah was there. Manoah was looking to see this man of God, which actually was an angel. And this is why he said, Lord, Lord, let me see this man. We're going to die. Get a grip. Look at what it says where we left off. This is, this, this just, it only, it just gets better. It only gets better. Verse 24. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man, what church? Yeah. And the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. Verse 24. And the young man grew and the Lord God blessed him, and the Spirit, capital S, watch this, and the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him. 
That's what we're going to talk about today. The Spirit of the Lord began to what? Stir them. As the Lord showed me this passage this morning, and I began to research the word stir, there are so many times in the Old Testament and the New Testament where God's Holy Spirit stirs the spirit inside a man. The stirring of God in our spirit. It's incredible when you, when you get into it. Matter of fact, if you look at the 25th verse where it does say, and the spirit of the Lord God began to stir him, speaking of Samson from the time of birth on, the spirit of the Lord God began to stir him. The Hebrew word used in this text for, for stir is payam. Everybody say payam. Oh, it just gets so beautiful when you understand what stir really means in the Hebrew. Payam to stir. It means to push. It means to impel. It means to drive. It means to urge forwards. It means to press on to the point of taking action. Now think about that in the actual text of what we just read. In verse 25 where it says, the Spirit of the Lord begin to stir Samson. When we understand what payam, the Hebrew word, for stir is, it means that God was pushing Samson. God was impelling Samson. God was driving Samson. God was urging Samson forward in his life. And God was pressing Samson on to action. So when you understand now that what the word stir means and understands that, understand that God stirs with his spirit in your spirit, you begin to understand God can do a big work up inside of me. He's stirring me. He's stirring me. He's stirring me into something that I can't work up or conjure up in my own self. The power of God is stirring in the church. And it's a beautiful thing. Matter of fact, the word stir has two different spellings for it. Payam is one. We're going to see what the second one is. And the reason there's two different spellings is because there's an additional meaning to the word stir. We're going, to, we're going to get into that in just a moment. But I would like to tell you this, church, what a tremendous blessing and advantage that we have as Christians that God stirs us. I mean, think about it. The literal spirit of God stirs our spirit. What an advantage we have that God is driving us, that God is leading us. But there's only one catch. There's only one catch to the stirring of God in our spirit that we must be willing to listen and then obediently follow the leading of the Holy Spirit stirring. That's the only catch. To have the mindset, and this is, this, this is, this is, this is mind-blowing, this is mind-blowing, just to have the mindset of stir me, Lord. See, my, my prayer for everyone in this room and even those that are unable to make it to this church today, my prayer for the whole body of Christ all over the world has begun to this day forward be for the church. Stir me, Lord. Make me fresh. Do you remember uh, Brother Jim was sharing with me this morning when the Israelites were complaining and Moses, they were complaining to Moses and, and God told Moses, pick up the stick and throw it into what? Water. Because there was bitter water, and there had to be a God stirring to make something bitter turn fresh. If the power of God doesn't stir that little pool, there's no fresh water. I just think it's incredible that even as, even as believers, even as Christians, there's sometimes where we can get bitter, and the only thing that's going to stir us into freshness and newness of life again is the one who gave it to us when we first got saved, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? I mean, it is this good stuff when you understand the stirring of the Lord. God is stirring in me. He's directing me. He's directing you. He's propelling you. He's pushing you. He's urging you. It's just down to whether or not we're willing to listen and then be obedient because it's a, it's a two-step process. We have to first listen, and then we have to be obedient to the call. So whatever he's urging us for in that moment, we've got we've to hear it, receive it, and then we have to be able to be obedient to do. So it's a two-step process. Stirring, I mean, think about it. The, the, the same God that created the entirety of this world stirs in your spirit. 
And so many times in the Old Testament, if you go home and look this up, so many times in the Old Testament and the New Testament, it says that God stirs our spirit. I'm not just pulling one little verse out and trying to make this great topic over one verse, but even if it was just for that one verse, it's still worth it. But numerous, numerous, numerous times it says that God stirs the spirit of a man. And so many times in life, so many times in life, we allow things to come in and block us from receiving and feeling and experiencing the stirring of the Lord. The stirring of the Lord. I want to I talk for just briefly on this, this mindset of stir me, Lord, because what it is is this, church, when I, don't, when I don't know what's going on, stir me, Lord. Amen? Stir me up. When, when I don't have a clue of what's about ready to happen, Lord, stir me up. When I don't understand what the outcome is going to be, Lord, stir me up. When I don't know what direction to take, Lord, stir inside of my spirit and lead me down the path that you want me to take right here. Stir something new and fresh in me, God. Stir me up. Stir me up. I think uh, that's going to be my plea for the Lord as long as I can hang on to it. When I go to pray every single time to God, I, I, I'm just going to say, Lord, stir in me, stir in me. If, I, if, I'm, if I'm ready to listen, if I'm, going, if I'm going to God to listen, I just want to say, God, stir in me right now. Stir in me the answer. Stir in me the solution. Stir in me what I need to hear from you. Just stir it up. Make it fresh, God. Take bitter. Make it sweet. Amen? Take, take hardness. Make it soft. Stir in me, God. Stir up inside of me. And so I want to show you something else in Scripture. Go to, go to Ezra chapter 1. Head to, it's still going to be in the Old Testament, but head towards the New Testament, a few books. You're going to run into it. Ezra chapter 1. Ezra chapter 1, we're going to look at the first verse and read for a second. Ezra chapter 1, verse 1. In the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord God by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord God did what? The Lord God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus. Lowercase s, it's talking about his spirit, not the spirit of God. Uh, he stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a what, church? Proclamation, okay? So that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing. Now stop right there at the second verse, please. Verse 1 tells us, look at it. Verse 1 tells us that God stirred up the spirit of Cyrus and God put such a stirring inside Cyrus that Cyrus couldn't help but make a proclamation. And I think that's incredible stuff because without the stirring of his spirit, there's no proclamation. Matter of fact, according to the first verse, the only, way, the only reason there is a proclamation is because it, it was going to be known that as spoke so out of the mouth of Jeremiah, this is why it says, as it might be fulfilled or it will or would be fulfilled. And at that point, is coming fulfilled as he says it. And so it says that God stirred up the spirit of the king Cyrus. He stirred up his spirit. And then when God started stirring up the spirit inside of the man, he then says, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overcome. Here comes forth a proclamation. And he not just spoke it, but he wrote it down. What I want you to see here, church, is this. When God stirs in you, it causes you to proclaim and live out loud that what he's doing up on the inside of you. Remember, salvation produces sanctification. And when God stirs up something on the inside, Lord, stir me up. I can't help but proclaim who is on the inside stirring around in my soul. Stirring around in my soul. I mean, this is how good God is that he, he stirs us up, he stirs us up, he stirs us up. Lord, make me new, make me fresh. It's kind of like if you leave your wheelbarrow outside or an old bucket outside for too long, it's hot, it's humid, you get a thunderstorm, fills up with some rain, you go about two, three, four weeks, 
month down the road, you forget that it was out there. You go to move it, and the water has become all stagnant. The mosquitoes and the, and the little bug-laying things have come down, egg-laying bugs have come down, and they've laid their eggs, and there's a little film across the water. And the only way to get that water looking fresh again is to take your old stick and stir it up. Stir me up. Because sometimes life puts stuff inside of me that I allow to get in there through my own emotions or my own wrong way of thinking. And, and I just need to be stirred up again. How many people have needed to be stirred up again? Should be every single one of you. I just need to be fresh. I want to be made new. God, stir me up again because I'm getting tired and it's my own fault. See, anytime we get tired, it's only one answer and it's because I'm not pressed into the power of God. How many people can acknowledge that God's power never fails you? How many people can acknowledge that God's power never tires you? See, when I get tired of doing right, it's only because I've gotten myself to withdraw out of the power of Almighty God. That's it. I'm not on the road he's called me on. I'm not thinking the way that he's called me to think. I'm not living or doing what he's called me to live or do. And matter of fact, this, this is incredible. Uh, someone at this church taught me this uh, about a year ago, and he proved it in Scripture, and it's a beautiful thing when you actually get a grip on it. If you ever become angry with someone, all it simply means is that your heart is not right. And we can back, back that up biblically. If you ever become angry with someone, I'm not talking about a righteous anger. Most people use righteous anger for an excuse to have sinful anger. Very few of us have a righteous anger. Okay, you got, you got to understand where I'm coming from. So, so many times we, we, we scheme it up as righteousness just because we don't want to forgive. Well, that's righteous anger. No, if you just forgave them, you wouldn't even have that. Well, that's righteous anger. Well, if you just loved them, you wouldn't even have that. What are you upset about? Let's love each other. And we all, myself included, fall guilty of being unloving. How many people are with me in that boat? So, God, what I need you to do is I need you to stir fresh in me today because today I just feel old and stale and stagnant. I just need to be made new. Stir in me today. Stir in me. And here's the incredible thing. God so stirred in the spirit of King Cyrus that he made a proclamation to everyone in the kingdom, this is how it's going down. Imagine what would happen to everyone in our kingdoms, everyone in our homes, if, if the true men became true men of God and stood up with a righteous decree and proclamation, this is the way it's going to happen. If our community leaders actually stood up with a righteous decree and a proclamation of this is the way it's going to happen. If the church actually was willing to be stirred up and say this is the way that it's going to happen. It would be incredible. It would be incredible. I firmly believe if the body of Christ truly acted like the body of Christ, the way that they were supposed to, revival would break out all over the face of this earth. I'm convinced of it. That's what it's meant to do. So verse 1, look at it again. Verse 1 tells us that God stirred up uh, the, it, it, the spirit of Cyrus and God put such a stirring inside of him, such a stirring that Cyrus couldn't help but make the proclamation, and he wrote down a decree. Look at Ezra chapter 1, verse 3. Let's press forward in the word of God, praise the Lord. Ezra chapter 1, verse 3, the word of God says this, hallelujah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of this place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. Verse 5. Then rose up the heads of the fathers of the houses of Judah. Now, what we've got to understand, church, uh, what's going on in verse 3, 4, 5, and into 6, what's happening is, is they're, they're getting instructions uh, on to go forward and rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. So when it says wherever they are that they so sojourn, wherever they travel, wherever they live, wherever they're working, then so hear this proclamation 
from and of the Lord. And so he's, he's getting attention of everybody. And he's saying that everybody's going to come in and make provision. Now this gets so beautiful. Look at verse 5. Let's see how this affects us. Then rose up the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin. So in other words, it's saying everybody, everybody in control here. And the priests and the Levites, they all rose up. And it says, watch this, speaking of all that rose up, it says, everyone, verse 5, everyone whose spirit God had, what church? Stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was freely offered. These people were bringing everything they had. And it wasn't because they so had an idea to bring these people everything they had. It's because God stirred up in their spirit to take their goods and roll on and provide for somebody else for the building of the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. If God's spirit doesn't stir in Cyrus to make a proclamation, that house never gets rebuilt. It's incredible how God chose a man to proclaim his decree. Isn't that good? How many people understand that God can use you too? I mean, look at your neighbor and say, you're usable. Yes, man, you're usable. You are so usable. There's no one in here that's used out, burn up. Okay, burnout. out. There, no one in here is unusable. You may feel burnout. Listen, you may feel burnout, but the fact that you're still here just shows that you're looking to be recharged. You're in the right place. You're still usable. You're still usable. So the Spirit of God is stirring up inside Cyrus to the whole point to where Cyrus makes his proclamation, shoots out a decree on paper, they ink it out on paper, and all of a sudden it says that God, verse 5, it says that God stirs up in the fathers, plural, he stirs up in the priests, plural, he stirs up in the heads, plural, he stirs up into the leaders, plural, he stirs up into their spirit, and next thing you know, people are bringing silver, people are bringing gold, people are bringing food, People are bringing beasts and animals for sacrifices. People are bringing fine linens and goods of extreme worth, and they're just dumping it in this heap pile, saying, we don't know why we're here other than God has stirred us to bring it to be a help so this house can be rebuilt. That's the power of God stirring in a man. It's beautiful stuff. Many times when... God has had me preach on, on, on a certain scripture. People will come back to me later in the week and say, oh, I saw so-and-so or their pastor or the TV pastor, so-and-so was preaching on that same topic. That's incredible. What I've learned is this. Oftentimes when God has a word to the church, do, do you understand that God does not separate his body the way that we do? So many times in our flesh we, we, we separate the Baptists or the Methodists or the Pentecostals or the Presbyterians or the Catholics or... You know, so, 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 so we separate it. Do you know that God sees it as the body? Do you understand that? And God gives a word to the righteous that listen, that will proclaim the proclamation. And so when you hear pastors give the same word in the same moment, it's because God spoke to the heart of man and stirred up inside of him. It's awesome. It's a beautiful thing when God stirs in an individual. And see, here's, here's the cool thing. The really cool thing is, is that God's willing to stir in us every day of the week, all day long. Matter of fact, many of us, God stirs us in our sleep. We just don't realize it. We wake up in the middle of the night wide awake, and we don't know what it is that we're doing wide awake. He's stirring us because we need to be praying in the spirit over something. We need to be praying over something. We need to just listen. Maybe we need to sit down and get in his word because it's been a while. He's woke us up, and the only reason after laying there for 30 minutes that we figure we're up is because we just want to go get some chocolate icing and a glass of milk. Well, I must just be up because I'm hungry. Hey, I'm telling you, the next time you wake up, listen, this is real stuff. The next time you wake up and you can't get yourself back to sleep, start listening to God and say, Father, just speak. Stir in me. Because he will stir you to the point of waking up. I've shared it in here again, and I'm going to share it for the people that haven't heard it. Many times, many times, I've woken up 
More times than I can count, I've woken up by a knock at the front door of my house. The first two or three times it happened, I woke up, slammed in the middle of the night, and I'd run in the door. I'm looking out. Turn the lights off so I can see better through the yard. Go check the backyard. Go back in bed, lay there, wide awake, couldn't sleep. End up just falling asleep later on out of boredom. Middle of the night. About the fourth time that happened, I realized, I don't know if it's an angel at the door or if it's just God knocking in my spirit, stirring me up. But it's the coolest thing because now when it happens, and it's always the same spacing between each knock, it's always at the same volume, same level, it always sounds the exact same. It is so beautiful to hear a knock of God. I just wake up and say, all right, Lord, you done stirred me. I'm listening. See, I don't believe, and this is just for me, in those moments that God is waking me up for me to talk to him. I do plenty of that. I believe he's waking me up so I can listen to him because I do a lot less of that. Anybody willing to be honest with me on that? We do more talking than we do listening. And this is why our emotions get in the way. This is why our feelings get in the way. Because I'm so willing to share, I'm a lot less willing to hear. And there's a difference between hearing and there's a difference between hearing and receiving. Because if I can hear you, even though I disagree with you, I can receive why you feel that way, and I can love you rather than be angry at you. Everybody got that? And so it's a stirring in my spirit. It's a stirring in my spirit of God on all levels where I just say, fix me, Lord. I've got problems. Fix me. I need to be renewed. I need to be refreshed. Fix me. So if you look at the fifth verse, look at it again. If we can put uh, verse 5 back up on the wall, please, brothers. Uh, then rose up the heads of the fathers, houses of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. And all who were about them aided them with vessels of silver, with gold, with goods, with beasts, and with costly wares, besides all that was uh, what offered? Freely. Freely offered. You see, here's, here's the deal when it, when, it, when, it, when, it, when it comes down to it. God was driving them. He was urging them forward. God was pressing them into action for his glory. So in other words, we take this scripture and we apply it to our own life. This is how I like to apply this passage into my own life anyway. And I, and I encourage other people to, to receive this in Jesus as well. When, when we need people in our life to move, when in any direction, whether it be their thinking or believing or receiving salvation, turning to the gospel for the salvation of their souls, whether it be seeking the face of God, whether it be asking God Almighty to do a stirring in their spirit, God can move in ways that we can't move. Amen? God can move in ways that we can't move. God can change what we can't change. How many people acknowledge that? God can fix a marriage that you and I can't fix. How many people know that? God, I'm just trusting you to stir in that marriage over there. I don't know, you know, there's, there's, they say there's three sides to every story. His, hers, and the truth is somewhere in the middle. Amen? God, I don't, I don't know everything that's going on over in that house. But God, do a stirring in there the way that I can't stir in their soul. Stir in them. Hey, how many of you believe this? If God can stir a nation to bring free gold, silver, and wares, and beasts, and food, how many believe that God can stir in the soul of a man to fix his marriage and act right? See, there's people in this room, the Holy Spirit has already showed me who. There's people in this room now that have a hard heart. And because of it, they can't even receive the word that's being given. Stir, Lord, in my soul. Stir. Do we really, do we really, do we really believe that if God can bring a nation to bring everything that they've worked hard to, to pile it up in a heap, do we really believe that he can fix the mess that we're facing? Or do we feel that our mess is bigger than the mess of the nation of Israel? Their mess was so big that God punished them for 40 more years. Anybody in here ever been punished for 40 years? I say it all the time. We may have issues, but thank God none of us in here got problems. See, because if there's a problem, it means there's a heart problem. If God can make the nation of Israel bring their goods and heap it up because he stirred in their spirit, 
then surely my same Father can stir in mine and yours and make all well. That is beautiful. Stir in us, Lord. Stir in my marriage. Stir in my relationship with my children. Stir in my relationships with my ministry. Stir in my relationships when I go places. Stir in my relationship in my own mind. Stir, Father, stir, stir, stir in my prayer life. Stir in my reading time. Stir in my worship and my praise time with you, Lord. Stir in me when I'm riding down the road. Stir in me when I'm talking on the phone. Stir in me, God, when I'm in the shower. Stir in me, God, so that I don't become stale, hard, angry, and stagnant. Stir. How many people acknowledge that if you let God stir you and fresh you, you'd love people more? I'm the first one to raise my hand. First one to raise my hand. See, remember I told you earlier that the word stir means that God presses? You've got to hear this. If you get nothing else, man, you've got to hear this part of God's word. Remember earlier we talked about how the word stir means God's pressing, he's pushing, he's propelling, he's igniting you forwards, he's forcing you to go forwards. This word stir is actually spelled air, H-E-I-R. Everybody say air. It's the same word to a degree, but it's just a different meaning behind it. Now watch how beautiful God is. So when God stirred in the spirit of the Israelites right here, what it means is he woke up a sleeping soul. Ah, it's beautiful. He woke up a sleeping soul. It doesn't mean that they weren't believing in God. What it means is is that they were in a temporary slumber. How many of us have been in a slumber before? When you really study the root word of this Hebrew word, air, it means that they were in a temporary sleep. And they weren't listening. They weren't following God. They weren't doing what God called. So it says that God spiritually woke them up. It's not a physical sleep. It's a spiritual sleep to where they weren't seeing things clearly. They weren't hearing the opinions of others clearly. They weren't loving clearly. They were easily angered. And God says, I'm going to stir you and force you to wake up. This is what's so great about pleading to God to stir in your soul because God God corrects what we don't see is wrong. God corrects what I don't have the power to correct. How many of you have been so angry you don't even know why you're angry? started off something small, and it just bruised up and festers into something ugly. And then you realize, what in the world am I really angry with him for? See, what happens is, what happens is, is that God is waking these folks up spiritually. He's airing them, H-E-I-R. He's waking them up on a spiritual level, not on a physical level. He stirs in their spirit, and he says, bring this stuff to my people to rebuild my house in Jerusalem. And they all just wake up and go. No arguing with God right there. They all just woke up and got to moving. It's a beautiful thing, the obedience of God's people. See, as God stirs us, so we too as believers are to stir one another on to good things. Amen? So we too are to stir one another. I want to show you something well, I tell you what, before I do, let me, let, me, let, me, let me share an example with you. How many of you in here like cake? Most, some people don't. Some people don't. How many, oh, here we go. More people do this in, in, in the country. How many people like cornbread? Cornbread lovers? Cornbread lovers? This is the sad truth. I'd rather eat cornbread batter than cake batter any day of the week. Ain't that bad? You ever had some good cornbread batter, man? It's just sweet as icing off a cake, man. Just when, you, when, you, when you put the ingredients together in the bowl for your cake or your cornbread, you can't just put the ingredients in the pan and shove it off into the oven, right? You can't just empty the box, drop an egg, and put it in the oven. But you got to what? Stir it up. So that all of the ingredients can marry one another. Right? Now we take it a step further. When you, how many of you love to put good season or good rub on your meat before you cook it? 
you don't just take the rub in itself and just plop it all up on there. You mix your rub. Or even if, you, if you're like me and you just get it right off the shelf in a bottle already liquefied, you still take it, you shake it, don't you? You're stirring it up. Now let me take it a step deeper. Before you stir your cornbread mix or your cake mix, you look down at that little golden egg that brings so much flavor, and you got to do what to it? You got to break it. The Lord showed me that this morning. It just brought tears, man, all over my desk. That in God's stirring to produce good things, there's also breaking. It's the intermingling of all those ingredients. It's the intermingling of all of the body parts of Christ in the church. It's the, it's the intermingling of uh, uh, differences, and it's okay, but the main thing, that yoke that brings us together is love. This is why Jesus says uh, his burdens are easy, and the yoke is what? My yoke is easy. Burden is what? And so he showed me, the Lord actually, I love him, he, he actually showed me this yoke being broke. And then as the yoke was broken, he showed me the stirring of this, of this mix in this bowl. And the egg that once was singular now became unified with the mixture. And it married one another. There's beauty in brokenness, do you know that? There's order in brokenness. A lot of people have it backwards. They think there's no order in being broken. If you want order, you've got to be broke first. So if you're here this morning and you just feel wore out, you feel abused, you feel broken, you're in a real good spot for getting fixed. <laughs> Incredible spot, men and women. Incredible spot for being fixed, knowing that you're broken. Because if you don't acknowledge that you're broken, you still have to get to that part in the process first. Praise God you're there. Let me show you something in Scripture. It just gets better. It just gets better. It just gets better. Uh, let's go to, go to John chapter 5 in the first verse. We're going to close with this thought right here. John chapter 5. And we're going to begin with the first verse, John 5, 1. We're going to read for a little bit, so hang in there. <clears throat> John 5, 1, the word of God says this, praise the Lord. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades, and in these lay a multitude of uh, invalids, blind, lame, and paralyzed. One man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years, and when Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already been there for a long time, he said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up, and while I'm going, another steps down before me, and Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed and walk. And at once, the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. See, that's all fine and good, but incredible actually. But even in the ESV text, it leaves out a verse. If you've noticed, verse 4 ain't in there. However, if you look down in the study note of it, they do include it. And this is what it says, verse 4. For an angel of the Lord went down at certain seasons into the pool and stirred the water. And whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was healed of whatever disease he had. At certain seasons, the angel would go down to the pool in the colonnade. And matter of fact, they've located these colonnades today in Israel. 
certain seasons, angel, the angel of the Lord would come and he would go down the steps and he would stir and the first one to get down the steps and into the water in time would receive a miracle from the Lord. But what I love about this passage here, friends, is Jesus is really telling this man this through his actions. He says, you don't need the angel to stir the waters. I'll do a stirring inside of your body right now. He says, do you want to heal, heal him? Do you want to be healed? Because Jesus was willing to heal what's been broken for the past 38 years. Imagine that. 38 years of brokenness. Some of you may have been struggling with marriages that have been broken for years. Some of you may have been struggling with relationships that have been in pain, broken, and hurting for years. Some of you may have been lost in depression for years. Some of you in confusion for years. Some of you just not knowing why you're here or what is your purpose for, for years, for years. And you just, you just don't have a grasp or a grip on why. All you know is, is that there's an empty void and that you're hurting on the inside. But for 38 years, this, this crippled man sat on the steps for 38 years waiting for an angel to stir up some water. And Jesus essentially just looks at him and says, do you want to be healed today? Because I'll stir something up on the inside of you that what no one could do other than me over the past 38 years. No one. Then maybe you're at a point in your life where you're just unhappy with yourself. You're unhappy with your spouse. You're unhappy with children or grandchildren. Maybe you're unhappy with your job. But, but rather than focus on that unhappiness, we need to be focused on God. See, rather than be focused on things, we must be focused unto the Lord. That This is why he calls us to look heavenward with our minds looking up and our eyes drawn heavenward unto the Lord. It doesn't mean that we're going to be perfect. We all screw up. But it does not give us an excuse not to daily ask for God to fix our screw-ups. Just because we're angry or confused or lack of understanding. God, stir in my spirit. Stir in my spirit. Let's stand and pray. If there's anyone here today that has a desire for the Lord to stir, make you fresh, make you new, no matter how long you've been saved, no matter how hard you are this morning, no matter how uh, much uh, misunderstanding or you can't grasp it, you can't reason it, you just don't know, just not feeling like receiving it, just not feeling like feeling it, God, just stir in my soul. See, one of the most dangerous things, one of the most dangerous points and places we can be is at the point where we become so stiff-necked or so hardened that we're just fine with not growing today because we just need to deal it and work in it in ourselves. No, 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 no. Don't take that authority away from God. You don't have to reason anything. You don't have to work anything out. You let God stir. You let God stir. Because if you try to work it out, it's just going to cause feelings of flesh to rise up. Don't you work it out. Just ask God to stir. And that yoke that comes down that's easy, that burden that's light, just gets stirred up with ingredients, with love and gentleness and kindness and self-control. It's so beautiful when there's a brokenness. But God, I don't want to love. It doesn't make sense to love right now. I don't, I don't want to be gentle. I'm angry right now. I'm hardened. Someone's hurt my feelings. I don't know how to handle this. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, just allow God to break it. Stubbornness, let him break it. Unwillingness, let him break it. It's a beautiful thing. And we're all, including myself, 
we're learning this together every day of our lives. Amen? Every day of our lives. If you're here today and you've got, you've got that desire to have the power of God stir in you, to show you things, to speak to you about things, right where you are, will you just raise your hand? I'd love to pray for you. If you have a desire for the power of God to stir in you, Father, I, I pray for every person that desires for you to speak and stir in their life right now with their hand raised. God, I pray that they would boldly proclaim a proclamation that you are Lord and that you are King of their life. Father, I pray in the name of the blood of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, how precious you are, that we would hear clearly, that we would think and see clearly, that we would understand clearly what an honor and a privilege it is that you stir in our spirit. For all those that are here today and you've never asked Jesus to save your soul, I'm telling you, there's no better way. If, 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 if you're here today and maybe you think you've asked him to save your soul, ah, I don't know if it really worked, I, I'm questioning it, then look, today's your day to make that right. Today's your day to believe and confess that Jesus is Lord, to start new today, to start new today. And if you'd like to receive Jesus as your Savior today, would you just raise your hand where you are? Would you just raise your hand where you are, friend? If today's your day to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord of your life, you're tired of fighting it, you're tired of struggling, you're tired of being on your own, and I don't know if what I've been doing is working. I, I don't know if he hears me, but today I want to be sure that he does. If you're here today, raise your hand. If you just need to be clear. Father, I pray that you would stir in us, that you would wake us, that you would shake us, that you would break us, and that you would mold us and love us and grow us as we honor you. 1 Samuel 2.30, for those who honor you, you honor in return. So Father, I thank you for the encouragement of your word today. I thank you for every one of these folks that have come here to hear it, that have come here to worship you and praise you in spirit and truth. What a blessing to my soul that they're here. And I pray, Father, that you richly reward them and do a stirring work in their lives, God. I, I, I earnestly, I pray that you do a stirring work that only you can do in us. May we be faithful to seek your face always. In Jesus, in Jesus' name and blood we pray. Everybody, church, said together. Let's give God a clap of praise. He's worthy to be praised. God is good, amen? I want to... We're looking at the very end of this month of having a cookout here in, in the backyard to celebrate being debt free. Amen? And so I'll send out an email and Facebook it. If you're currently not getting our emails, you need to get to the sound room and leave your email with them. First and last name, put your email address, we'll add you into the system. Facebook, like us on CFO Church, capital C, capital F, capital O, capital C, lowercase uh, H U R C H. Um, and I, this week, I'll announce that date when we're going to stay after in fellowship. Amen? God is good. Look at your neighbor and say, stay stirred up. Amen. God bless you.